41. The Laws of Nature First published in the Coventry Evening Telegraph, 4th of April 1945, and reproduced in Undeceptions, 1971, this is now in God in the Dock, 1998. Poor woman, said my friend. One hardly knows what to say when they talk like that. She thinks her son survived Arnhem because she prayed for him. It would be heartless to explain to her that he really survived because he was standing a little to the left or a little to the right of some bullet. That bullet was following a course laid down by the laws of nature. It couldn't have hit him. He just happened to be standing off its line, and so all day long as regards every bullet and every splinter of shell. His survival was simply due to the laws of nature. At that moment my first pupil came in and the conversation was cut short. But later in the day I had to walk across the park to a committee meeting, and this gave me time to think the matter over. It was quite clear that once a bullet had been fired from point A in direction B, the wind being C and so forth, it would pursue a certain path. But might our young friend have been standing somewhere else? And might the German have fired at a different moment, or in a different direction? If men have free will, it would appear that they might. On that view, we get a rather more complicated picture of the Battle of Arnhem. The total course of events would be a kind of amalgam derived from two sources. On the one hand, from acts of human will, which might presumably have been otherwise, and on the other, from the laws of physical nature. And this would seem to provide all that is necessary for the mother's belief that her prayers had some place among the causes of her son's preservation. God might continually influence the wills of all the combatants so as to allot death, wounds, and survival in the way he thought best, while leaving the behaviour of the projectile to follow its normal course. But I was still not quite clear about the physical side of this picture. I had been thinking, vaguely enough, that the bullet's flight was caused by the laws of nature. But is this really so? Granted that the bullet is set in motion, and granted the wind and the earth's gravitation and all the other relevant factors, then it is a law of nature that the bullet must take the course it did. But then the pressing of the trigger, the side wind, and even the earth are not exactly laws. They are facts or events. They are not laws, but things that obey laws. Obviously, to consider the pressing of the trigger would only lead us back to the free will side of the picture. We must, therefore, choose a simpler example. The laws of physics, I understand, decree that when one billiard ball, A, sets another billiard ball, B, in motion, the momentum lost by A exactly equals the momentum gained by B. This is a law. That is, this is the pattern to which the movement of the two billiard balls must conform provided, of course, that something sets ball A in motion. And here comes the snag. The law won't set it in motion. It is usually a man with a cue who does that. But a man with a cue would send us back to free will. So let us assume that it was lying on a table in a liner, and that what set it in motion was a lurch of the ship. In that case, it was not the law which produced the movement, it was a wave. And that wave though it certainly moved according to the laws of physics, was not moved by them. It was shoved by other waves, and by winds, and so forth. And however far you traced the story back, you would never find the laws of nature causing anything. The dazzlingly obvious conclusion now arose in my mind. In the whole history of the universe, the laws of nature have never produced a single event. They are the pattern to which every event must conform, provided only that it can be induced to happen. But how do you get it to do that? How do you get a move on? The laws of nature can give you no help there. All events obey them, just as all operations with money obey the laws of arithmetic. Add six pennies to six, and the result will certainly be a shilling. But arithmetic by itself won't put one farthing into your pocket. Up till now, I had had a vague idea that the laws of nature could make things happen. I now saw that this was exactly like thinking that you could increase your income by doing sums about it. The laws are the pattern to which events conform. The source of events must be sought elsewhere. Uh, this may be put in the form that the laws of nature explain everything except the source of events. But this is rather a formidable exception. The laws, in one sense, cover the whole of reality except... 
well, except that continuous cataract of real events which makes up the actual universe. They explain everything except what we should ordinarily call everything. The only thing they omit is the whole universe. I do not mean that a knowledge of these laws is useless. Provided we can take over the actual universe as a going concern, such knowledge is useful, and indeed indispensable for manipulating it. Just as, if you only have some money, arithmetic is indispensable for managing it. But the events themselves, the money itself, that is quite another affair. Where, then, do actual events come from? In one sense, the answer is easy. Each event comes from a previous event. But what happens if you trace this process backwards? To ask this is not exactly the same as to ask where things come from, how there came to be space and time and matter at all. Our present problem is not about things, but about events. Not, for example, about particles of matter, but about this particle colliding with that. The mind can perhaps acquiesce in the idea that the properties of the universal drama somehow just happen to be there. But whence comes the play, the story? Either the stream of events had a beginning, or it had not. If it had, then we are faced with something like creation. If it had not, a supposition, by the way, which some physicists find difficult, then we are faced with an everlasting impulse which, by its very nature, is opaque to scientific thought. Science, when it becomes perfect, will have explained the connection between each link in the chain and the link before it but the actual existence of the chain will remain wholly unaccountable. We learn more and more about the pattern. We learn nothing about that which feeds real events into the pattern. If it is not God, we must at the very least call it destiny, the immaterial, ultimate, one-way pressure which keeps the universe on the move. The smallest event, then, if we face the fact that it occurs, instead of concentrating on the pattern into which, if it can be persuaded to occur, it must fit, leads us back to a mystery which lies outside natural science. It is certainly a possible supposition that behind this mystery some mighty will and life is at work. If so, any contrast between his acts and the laws of nature is out of the question. It is his act alone that gives the laws any events to apply to. The laws are an empty frame. It is he who fills that frame, not now and then on specially providential occasions, but at every moment. And he, from his vantage point above time, can, if he pleases, take all prayers into account in ordaining that vast complex event which is the history of the universe. For what we call future prayers have always been present to him. In Hamlet a branch breaks and Ophelia is drowned. Did she die because the branch broke, or because Shakespeare wanted her to die at that point in the play? Either, both whichever you please. The alternative suggested by the question is not a real alternative at all, once you have grasped that Shakespeare is making the whole play. 